My name is Derek Traub, and I've been a writer with the LA Phil for the last 13 years. Today, I'm thrilled to share with you the story of how a group of visionary Angelinos turned this nondescript parking lot into one of the greatest music venues in the world. Walt Disney Concert Hall famously took 17 years to complete from inception to fireworks. So what took so long? I think a better question is, how'd they do it so quickly? Because the truth is, it took us 84 years to get to Walt Disney Concert Hall. The story starts in 1919, when an eccentric millionaire named William Andrews Clark Jr. founded the LA Phil. He recruited top-tier musicians from around the world. Clark's Knockout New Orchestra played its first shows in Trinity Auditorium in downtown LA. In 1920, we moved a few blocks north to our first permanent home, a converted Baptist church, which we renamed Philharmonic Auditorium. Now, Philharmonic Auditorium was neither the Philharmonics nor an auditorium. It was a church, not a concert hall. So it didn't have a backstage, a green room, or even a lobby. During intermission, audiences would just spill out onto Olive Street as cars weaved in and out of milling concert goers. On January 1st, 1921, the LA Times ran a full-page editorial thanking Mr. Clark for bringing such great music and musicians to Los Angeles. But it ended the piece by calling on him to help give his orchestra the kind of home it deserved. And if someday Clark should bring true in steel and stone another dream by furnishing an abiding place for this spirit of melody, a home for this orchestra, a temple for music as a civic asset of the city's highest and most creative phases of life, a great and beautiful palace of art. If such a dream should come true, what would the world say of Los Angeles then? That was written in 1921. It took 43 years for Los Angeles to even begin to realize the dream. In December 1964, we opened the doors of Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. While the pavilion is an absolutely spectacular place, it's not actually a concert hall. It's a multi-purpose auditorium. And as with all traditional theaters, the pavilion has a proscenium arch that separates the stage area from the audience. The LA Phil was a phenomenal band. We know this from recordings, reviews, and the performances we played on tour, but our home audiences had no idea what this orchestra could really do. Dorothy Chandler Pavilion brought us closer to realizing the dream of a concert hall for Los Angeles, but we weren't there yet. 23 years after the opening of Dorothy Chandler's Pavilion, another visionary philanthropist stepped forward. Lillian Disney announced in 1987 that she was giving $50 million to build a concert hall for LA and name it after her late husband, Walt. What's most remarkable about this? She contacted county officials and said that she wanted to give something back to the people of this city. She wanted to build a temple to endless creativity, a place where dreams could become a reality a place that would honor her husband's legacy. But Lillian Disney was not a young woman, and she didn't have 43 or even 23 years to wait around for this thing to get built. So she put a stipulation in the gift agreement that said if we didn't start construction within five years, she was taking her money back. The LA Phil, the Music Center, and civic leaders jumped into action right away. They formed a committee to conduct an international search for an architect. they landed on four finalists. While each design had its merits, I think it was a foregone conclusion. They were always going to land on the local kid, Frank Gehry, the only Angelino on the list. Two things in particular impressed the committee. First, in planning his design, 
Gary met with Lillian Disney and asked her what she envisioned for Walt Disney Concert Hall. She told him, I love brick houses covered in ivy with white columns. And Frank said, cool, that's not really what I do. But he agreed with Lillian that the hall should feel like a home, a place where everyone was welcome. Gary's design had a public park and a garden, entrances that were on the street level, so people could feel free to just wander in and look around. It had floral print carpets and brightly upholstered seats, and my personal favorite, the big cozy blue lounge chairs in the lobby. The auditorium would truly be a living room for the city. Second, they saw in Frank Gehry an up-and-coming superstar in the architectural world, and they were convinced that he was about to do the most groundbreaking work of his career. In this way, Gary fit perfectly with the young, creative, and open ethos of L.A. and the L.A. Phil, the orchestra that appointed a 26-year-old Zubin Mehta to be music director in 1962, and would later appoint a 26-year-old prodigy from Venezuela named Gustavo Dudamel. In 1989, another young conductor, Esa Pekka Salonen, was chosen for the music director job. Commitments in Europe kept Salonen from starting in Los Angeles until 1992. Because of Lillian Disney's five-year mandate, Salonen expected he'd arrive in Los Angeles in 92 with a fully designed concert hall already under construction. Things didn't go as planned. The ambition of Gary's design and a host of other factors caused costs to balloon well beyond the initial $50 million gift. The five-year window also happened to coincide with five of the most tumultuous years in the history of the city. Recession, drought, fires, mudslides, and civil unrest all led to feelings of malaise for Los Angeles. The city, the county, the LA Phil, the music center, the Disney family, and Gary's office all had competing priorities and visions for the concert hall, and no one entity was totally in charge. On the eve of that five-year deadline, the Disney Hall project broke ground, not on the concert hall, but on the parking garage beneath it. Unfortunately, then, the 94 Northridge earthquake struck. Building and safety codes were rewritten, and the hall's plans had to be totally redone. Frank Gehry's design was so complicated, builders would use lasers to ensure that each uniquely cut steel beam was positioned perfectly into place. This is not a roller coaster. This is Disney Hall. Facing a steep budget deficit, the county's managers began exploring options for selling the land to a developer. Philanthropist Eli Broad, Mayor Richard Reardon, and the Music Center's board chair, Andrea Vandekamp, stepped up and decided they would work together to save the project. The county told them, that's great and all, but you have to raise $75 million in the next 18 months, or we're pulling the plug. The three leaders created a campaign. They called it the heart of the city. It didn't focus on music or architecture, but rather on the importance of the hall to the city itself. The campaign worked. However, with the delays and increased costs, the project would still need another $75 million to be completed. Eli Broad thought Frank Gehry was a visionary designer, but that he should be replaced with a build architect who could complete a simpler version of Gehry's plans. Taking over for her mother as the Disney family's representative on the project, Diane Disney Miller sent an impassioned handwritten letter to Eli Broad. She wrote that she knew creative vision. She was a Disney after all and she saw in Frank Gehry the same kind of genius she saw in her father, the ability to make a dream manifest. Broad was convinced. He, Reardon, and Vandekamp were joined by dozens of civic champions and arts philanthropists who together raised the additional $75 million to bring the concert hall project to life. Construction was completed in 2003, Esa Pekka Salonen led the first rehearsal in the hall. The sound was stunning. The 17 years worth of careful deliberations and intentional choices paid off. After playing a minute or so of music, Salonen turned to Gary and shouted, Frank, we'll keep it. 
Los Angeles finally had a concert hall of its own. There was a three-night opening gala extravaganza in October 2003 with celebrities and fireworks. But the most meaningful part of the hall's opening, I think, were the two weeks before the galas. We hosted a dozen concerts called Fill the House that were dedicated to the community. There were concerts for teachers, for construction workers who built the place, for community leaders, and for school children. I love this photo because the sign says closed until October 23rd. But it's not close to these kids who are about to be some of the first people to hear a concert in Walt Disney Concert Hall. There have been well over 3,500 concerts in the hall since its opening, from symphonic cycles to celebrity recitals and everything in between. We've even turned the hall into an opera house, taking advantage of the versatility that Gary built into the performance space. For example, the stunning Tristan Project, which combined Wagner's music with astonishing visuals from video artist Bill Viola, or the three-year Mozart de Ponte trilogy, which included fully staged productions of three operas with sets designed by Pritzker Prize-winning architects, including Frank Gehry, who returned to build sets for Don Giovanni. Gary's design has had an impact on the LA Phil and the musicians and music lovers who have made it their musical home. Music has filled not just the stage, but the whole building with new music festivals like Noon to Midnight or Nimbus, a nine-ton interactive light and sound installation. We put on a year-long avant-garde Fluxus Festival, which one night turned the hall's stage into a giant kitchen for Alison Knowles' piece Make a Salad, and on another turned Grand Avenue into a splash zone with audience members up above dropping watermelons off the side of the building. Frank Gehry took the innovative, adventurous, and young spirit of Los Angeles and the LA Phil and translated that into a building. In 2018, visual artist Rafik Anadol presented Walt Disney Concert Hall Dreams. The installation turned the hall's exterior into a screen onto which we projection mapped all of the digitized data from the LA Phil's 100-year archive. The images, the faces, the music in that archive tell the stories of the thousands of people who worked across a century to get us to today. And now that we've made Walt Disney Concert Hall our home, I can't wait to see the stories we tell tomorrow. <laughs>